uh, this evening or today, I'm speaking with uh, Christine Erickson. She's the author of the book that came out in spring 2015, The Mother Within, A Guide to Accepting Your Childless Journey, published on Kindle, available on Amazon, and brilliantly nominated in May for an International Book Award. How amazing is that? Thank you, Jody. <laughs> so, so that um, the viewers have a bit of an idea about you know how you and I know each other, I just thought it'd be nice just to kind of maybe give a little bit of a background to you know to our story. I mean, I'm I'm Jody. I'm the founder of Gateway Women, which is um, well, I guess it's a global now uh, sort of friendship and support network for childless women. And I wrote a book um, called Rocking the Life Unexpected. And yeah, I mean, we met originally, I think, through one of uh, one of the online one of the online presentations I was doing, wasn't it? That's we met via Skype. Yeah, actually, I was the finder of Gateway Women. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, I found you online first, I believe. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I didn't, just couldn't believe that there was a community out mm -hmm. there because I didn't know at that time, and so it was, you know, one of those typical reaching out moments. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I remember for me when I wanted there to be something like Gateway Women, and right. I reached out, and there was nothing. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe it that there was nothing. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so I started writing. You know, just over four years ago now, I started writing my blog, and okay. then women from all over the world started going, "Oh, you're there. Me too." You know, and this amazing global sisterhood started to develop. You know, yeah. our tribe, which is a word you use in your book as well, and which, which really resonates, I think, for us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so that's a bit about me. So, you know, how, how about you? Could you, if you feel comfortable doing so, tell us a little bit about how you came to be a woman without children? I mean, we know, I mean, those of us who are without children know that there are so many different ways to get to this point rather than didn't want, couldn't have. Yes, definitely. Mm. Um, yeah, I I mean, this journey of writing this book has really taken me back to, mm. yes, how did I get here? Mm. And to those those choices and life circumstances differently. Yeah. Uh, I think really, you know, it goes back to the beginning of, of how I witnessed my own family and the pressures and not that I put on myself. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I really didn't have that pressure that I must get married, I must have children. Mm. I wasn't living that way. I was living in a space of learning and traveling and... Mm really knowing that I wanted to know myself well and with the assumption that I could be a mother when I chose to. Yeah. I, I just, I didn't even question it. Um, and so from there, when I, when I finally did get married, I thought I was doing the right things. You know, I got educated, I saw the world. And unfortunately, I ended up in a very abusive marriage. Um, to somebody who was extremely narcissistic and physically abusive. And it took me a while to move out of that relationship. Mm -hmm. And it was actually the idea and the admittance and acceptance that I could not have a child within that kind of environment mm -hmm. and relationship mm -hmm. that actually saved me from that relationship and moved me out yeah. of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, even that, making an intentional choice and at the same time having people respond to that as though I was very lucky, it was something that I was grieving. How, how was it lucky? I don't, I don't get that. It was, um, you know, I think the idea of not having to go, I mean, I, there are things I'm fortunate for. You know, I went through a divorce without having to have children in that situation or the aftermath of somebody with okay. that type of personality disorder. Um, so I see where the sentiment comes from, but it's often followed by, you know, a story about how they were saved by their children or the essence of that presence. Yes. And so I was deeply grieving my entire life vision, not only my marriage, but the family that I had envisioned and again assumed. Um, and so I left that relationship not by choice of not having children, but not having children in that environment. Mm -hmm. And really, it took me years to heal from that. There was a lot of trauma and really trying to be a healthy, intentional, conscious human being um, and getting myself back to that, let alone bringing someone else into that. And so, again, I wasn't fixed on that is my next step. I must find a relationship. I must find a child. I was being really conscious of what I could offer and not to myself, let alone anyone else. Which, in a way, is, is actually a deeply maternal thing to do. It's yes. interesting, you were actually really thinking about 
what what life can I can I give my future child? Yes, and definitely. how can I prepare for that by healing myself? And I think there's often not an understanding about how how much thought sometimes goes into not having children yet. Absolutely, you know, not Absolutely. knowing that it's actually those choices may be contributing to being childless. Yes, and that it's not fragmented or segmented in this, you know, kind of quick and dirty, oh, it's a career or those types of things. It's really not it. It's, it's so much deeper than that, yeah. so much yeah. deeper. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. thank well, you. Thank you for that because mm-hmm. um, I think so many people don't, don't get to hear the, the nuances of our stories. And so, you know, w- we can judge that people have very simplistic ideas about how we've arrived at things. But often, right. because we don't share our stories openly, they get, right. don't get to hear the real stuff anyway, which is yes. you know, why yeah. it's so powerful to, to write a book um, mm-hmm. and to share our story. Um, yeah. So I guess that takes me into my next question is, how come you came to write a book about childlessness? What made you want to do that? <laughs> you know, um, a couple of things. I was actually working on something else. <laughs> oh, it was a practice. <laughs> Procrastination technique. Yes. No, it was a part of it, but it kept emerging as this is what's present for me right now. Okay. This is what's okay. happening. In my, this is what is most poignant for me today. You know, yes, there's a history that led to this, which is what I was writing about. Um, but I just saw that poignancy through our conversations, through the community. And, and also because my story was a little different in that way of interpreting it, it wasn't a an, an infertility story as people asked me or expected often or, or different scenarios. Um, and I think that voice, bringing that voice out was really important to me because I think there are so many more women coming into that, that yeah. phase of yeah. fertility, infertility and in that age where we've made some really beautiful and conscious choices in our lives. Um, and we are maternal. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. telling that piece of the story, and also for my own expression and healing, of course, I mean, it was a process yeah. <laughs> going through yeah. that. Um, but yeah, it really started as a magazine article. And once <laughs> I started, <laughs> I, I couldn't stop. And I thought, yeah. hmm. No, I laughed because I remember when I sat down to write my book, I was going to write this little ebook on how to run a gateway women group. <laughs> And I was writing and I was going, that may be the book you were planning to write, but it's yeah. not the one that wants to be written. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's what happened with yeah. me too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I really, looking at the, the presence of our community, I mean, and the size of it, I mean, the global tribe, and seeing what, what is present and not, not only in open and visible conversations, but within communities, yeah. um, I thought, you know, I wanted to really lend my voice to that and support the people who have led this, you know, such as yourself. And I, I think that means a lot. I feel like I've stood alone in other it, you know, circumstances in my life or felt alone and didn't have a place to connect with that. Mm-hmm. And when there is one, I think it's really important that people know that. Mm-hmm. Um, and also to create the visibility that will be the catalyst for the kind of change in conversation, mm-hmm. in language, in assumptions, assessments, judgments, you know, that yeah. keep us yeah. in that pain mm-hmm. cycle. Yeah. Um, so that part of being the change or sharing a different space of acceptance, you know, I think is really critical. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree. I think that change happens, social change happens like this one story at a time. Yeah, you know, definitely. Someone might be listening to our chat now one day and it gives them perhaps a new way of looking at something in their life and that might inform their Knox conversation with someone else. And, you know, we have a beautiful chain reaction you know, yes. we, there's a great, there's a fairy story, which was my favorite fairy story when I was a little girl. And it's really interesting now. It's the emperor's new clothes. And mm. I always identify with the little kid who's kind of standing there in the crowd of the grown ups, pointing at the, the king with no clothes on and saying, but he's got no clothes on. Everyone's saying, yes, he's got clothes on, you know, and being the one that points out the illusion. And right. it seems so interesting to me that, you know, the, the, what life has asked of me, rather than the order I put in, <laughs> was, <laughs> was to be the one who, yes. who speaks out about this issue. And sometimes yeah. I think I'm like the taboo girl, you know what I mean? That's my superpower, you know, 
infertility, mm. childlessness, menopause, aging, death. You know what I mean? Let's talk yeah. about it. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm probably the person you wouldn't want to get stuck next to on a train. <laughs> you didn't be aware of what questions you ask. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's talk about blah. Now, before I go off on some bizarre riff about any of those topics, so um, I, my next question is: Your book is very strong on the social and cultural reactions to childless women. What are your thoughts about why this prejudice exists? I really think it comes down to one big piece of it is just the fear of people owning our identities, mm. whatever that might be, and the, the glamorization, the pronatalist space of what having a child offers somebody, mm. the attention, mm. the identity, the kind of carte blanche pass to certain things, at least for a period of time. Mm. And I think it becomes something to really embrace that sometimes covers other things or doesn't allow other things to expand. And so it becomes this very, very key and sometimes singular identity. Um, and in addition to that, I think just the, the natural, um, you know, the procreation space of ourselves as a species, as a conversation, yeah. you know, the fear of that, which, you know, I have a lot of things to say about that, but that's another conversation. But I really do think it comes down to those things of people, the mirror that gets reflected, mm -hmm. there's a real fear space in that of something not... Do you think that perhaps because motherhood is currently culturally extraordinarily valued, um, and I need to put a caveat in there, I think motherhood is incredibly important. However, yes. we're living through a historical moment where I would say it is carrying an enormous amount of extra cultural baggage. Uh, and is being idolized in a way that our mother's generation are just like, what? You know, right. it's a big change. I'm wondering if in a way, perhaps the, the shadow side of that adoration mm -hmm. in a way is, it, it lands on us. Yes, you know? absolutely. And I, I think that um, the space that we're in around motherhood that you just so eloquently said, I mean, it's a disservice to all women. Absolutely. Which absolutely. included. And that's, that's the sp pain spot then among us as women and where this conversation is going. Mm -hmm. um, and even the resistance, you know, we talked about the tribe and numbers. If 25% of women in our age category do not have children, that's a significant portion of the population. Yes. That's, not, that's not an oddity. <laughs> it's a presence. And in the UK, and, and in the UK, um, it's we don't collect data um, on men's, ch you know, whether they have children or not, which is in I, itself very yes. interesting. It's only one. Co it's only one country in the world that does, which is Norway. But there, someone did a, a meta-analysis of various different pieces of research to come up with a childlessness rate in the male population of 23 to 25 percent. So I think we can say that 25 percent of adults will be childless yes. you know yes. i mean it's a a, a very very sign i mean even for someone as bad as maths at me that's a very significant number yes yes mm. and so where are we in that conversation yes. you know just the focus on women mm. and and not the separation either in the conversation of motherhood and womanhood mm. You know, where does womanhood fall? Where does the status of women fall mm. when this is the angle and this is the prioritization? Mm. I think it's a, a really disturbing <laughs> space. You yeah, know? and I agree. It, it, it is difficult for all women, mothers or not, um, mm -hmm. because I think the extraordinary overvaluation of motherhood puts those women who are real mothers into a really mm -hmm. difficult place because they're people who are mothers. You know, they didn't yes. wake up one morning and become angels. You know, yes. they're people and they're struggling with, you know, child rearing, which is, as far as I can work out, you know, sort of long periods of boredom and care work punctuated by moments of joy. You know, it's like, it's, it's quite, it's, it's not, you know, yes. it is, but it's very, I mean, but the I'm visual really, is the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And for them not living up to that, you know, they've got all the guilt it's like they've got the guilt we've got the shame it's like we've kind of divided the really shitty emotions between us yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. absolutely so my own experience has been that women who aren't childless so younger women and mothers 
and men, mm -hmm. often don't seem to mm -hmm. be aware of the prejudices and stigmas we face. What do you think about that? I really, it, to me, it boils down to the ingrained perceived normalcy of it. They had an expectation and they lived it consciously, unconsciously, however that choice to have a child was arrived at. It fits into all kinds of things where you can just breathe mm. it, it, on the flip side of it. And so I think if you haven't had that challenged or you're not aware and your, your lifestyle is connected to what looks like you, mm. you know, is reflected mm. back in every system, in your neighborhood, in your, your family, um, what gives pause to consider that? I, you know, yeah, it's like how, how would they know? I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've found with, with younger women, not so much much younger women, I have um, nieces and goddaughters in their late teens and early 20s, and they're very mm -hmm. thoughtful on the issue and, you know, look to my experience. But women who are perhaps coming to, what, the end of their, the end of their fertility, let's say mm -hmm. women who are in their middle to late 30s and still mm -hmm. hopeful and aren't in any way, shape or form thinking it might not happen for them. I found them to be quite hostile sometimes towards the the idea that there is a, a prejudice faced. Um, I, I guess answering my own question, I suppose it's possibly a form of denial. But yeah, it's also an it's, idea that, well, yeah, that's what happened to you because you're a weirdo. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know? Yeah. That's not going to yeah. happen to me and how dare you even think it might. Go away with your patronising advice, you scary old cat lady. Yeah, I I think it gets really close to the heart and what is not yet conscious. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't. I mean, I was just, you know, I was sleepwalking. Mm -hmm. Sleepwalking through mm -hmm. my 30s in terms of my fertility because actually I didn't really know what, understand it. And I was on a panel the other day um, at the Women of the World Festival and I've been really thinking about this because someone put a comment on my blog and they said, you know, you women, you're all so educated, you're all so this, you know, of course you understood. How could you, how can you say now that you didn't know about your fertility? And I, and I really pondered on it. And I thought, mm -hmm. how come I didn't know? You know, because I'm a very resourceful person. If I need a piece of information, I go looking for it, you know, and I thought, why right. didn't I know? And then I realized the reason I didn't research it any further it's because I thought I had the information. What I didn't yes. know is that the information I had was wrong. Yes. You know, I thought 40 was the age when, you know, you had to start worrying. And then there was always IVF, which worked. <laughs> you know? I, I, well, I, and, the, and that's the message. That's, that's the message. Mm -hmm. I mean, every day there's a headline, mm -hmm. of some miracle, if yeah. not norm, yeah. around yeah. what else can be done. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that yeah, word I didn't miracle. Know either. Yeah, I love that word miracle because it's like there's a clue in the word. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. it happens very, 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 very rarely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think those those hope points are really misleading. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately misleading. Mm -hmm. You know, and then the conversation is reinforced. Yes. You know, again, what yeah. to say? What, how do we bridge those conversations? Mm -hmm. I mean, I I've, I've come up that all up against that all the time well you can still try my friend is this is age x she's 44 she's 46 she did this she's one person out of the millions of us mm -hmm. the millions yeah. you know yeah yeah we've all got to be somewhere on the bell curve and she's on a different place you know yeah. Yeah. Right. right yeah i do think that will become one of the more important conversations mm -hmm. though for younger women i think um just the the truths of that and the different truths of it yeah you know as yeah. you said the bell curve even even viewing it that way mm -hmm. you know that's it's not, not that's... 35 for everyone it's not 40 yeah. for everyone you know there are there are some women a, a very small few on the curve who will get, who conceive at 45 naturally and take the baby to full term but they're very 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 rare i mean we were unfortunate culturally in the UK that one of the one of the very few women that, that is able to do that was the wife of our then Prime Minister Tony Blair 
who got mm-hmm. pregnant naturally age 45 and they had a surprise late baby addition to their family. So, of course, that, that made it seem like, oh, it is possible because, you know, if you're yeah. still hopeful at that age, then you'll, you'll grab onto anything. And I, under- I understand that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, uh, actually, there's some really interesting stuff going on in the UK from a doctor who is looking to take fertility education into schools which I mm-hmm. think I think is really important because I think it the you know I certainly when I was at school the sex education was all about you know everything you can not to get pregnant right. you know even avoid warm chairs that boys have been on you know it's just like really be careful <laughs> <laughs> you never know <laughs> and um um but it's not about sort of scaring young women because then other people say well you right. can't tell young women that you know, because then, then they'll all rush out and get pregnant or they won't go to university or this, that and the other. And it's like, well, you know, do we treat do we treat them as women or do we treat them as idiots, you know? Right, exactly. That's it. Yeah, that was my response. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I wish Trust I had had more information. I think it would have fed into my choices. I don't know if my outcome would have been different, but someone the other day asked me if I regretted anything about my my childless journey. And interestingly, mm-hmm. that was the only thing that came up. I said, I wish I'd known more about, you know, the declining of egg quality over time, the success rates of IV. I said, just some really basic fact. I didn't want to be an expert, right. but, you know, just right. some basic stuff, yeah. So mm-hmm. I hope that that's something that, you know, these kinds of conversations and hopefully the work that, you know, women like us and women in the tribe will be doing over the next, you know, decade or two decades yeah, we'll start to yeah. shift that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's well, not that I want everyone to have a baby. I also want people to know that having not having a child exactly isn't that, the end of the world. Yes, but that conversation for young women, mm. that that's, yeah, um, yeah, that's a big one. So that's along it. with the fertility education, there also needs to be an opening up of, you know, the pronatalist story and saying there is, yeah. you can choose not to have children as well. Or if you choose to have children and it doesn't work out, it's going to be okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So I have another question, and this is a huge question. Okay. Um, so <laughs> hold on to your seats. What has helped you the most yeah. to come through the grief of childlessness? Mm-hmm. Truly embracing the mother within myself. I think I was trying so hard to kick her to the curb, thinking oh, I, I wouldn't feel it anymore, you know? And if, if not into a child, how would I legitimize that? And so shifting that piece and really owning it mm. and being mm. it and loving her and acknowledging the beauty in who I am because of that part of me, mm. and that mm. is in my who I am on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. and identifying that and really allowing allowing her to live again mm-hmm. that was the biggest shift for me loving that part of myself um, and and reintegrating her mm-hmm. consciously into who I am so interesting so to interesting. hear someone talking yes. about that because I've been through that process myself and I I, I that before it happened I had this sense, you know, that the kind of the loving that was inside me Mm -hmm. was almost going toxic. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like, I've just got to do something with this. Yeah. Or it's going to kill me somehow. It was so hard not to have an outlet for that nurturing, that compassion, just that care, the caring side of my nature. And I think also the side that wants to make something grow. You know, it's yes. kind of, it's, it's not just, you know, stroking puppies. It's, it's that yeah. desire to kind of create something. Yeah, I, I call it an unmet connection, mm. you know, the deepest one for me. And so how do you touch that? You know, how do you touch it? How do you create it when the expectation internally and externally is on one outcome of that? Mm. One picture of that. So, and one reality. So, so how did you do it? Really, I was in this, the pain cycle that you just 
that you just described. It was like, I cannot keep stay in this. I can't yeah. stay in it anymore. It was, it was going toxic. It was a constant conversation recycled over and over and over again. And I really had to practice sitting and just letting myself be, letting myself grieve instead of trying to prevent the grief, instead of trying to hold in that toxicity that you're talking about. And then just listen. And it, and it came, that piece of the mother within came kind of organically. And then it's an everyday, hour to hour move through that. You know, constantly using my own tools, my own coaching tools, you know, spending time outside in nature, things that I really connect with to hold a connection for myself that has that same truth in it, if that makes hold sense. Hold a connection that has yeah. that same truth in it. Yeah, yeah. That, really, that really resonates for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess what I found really hard for a while was I sort of didn't know how to do that anymore. I think yeah. I felt so disconnected mm -hmm. and also, you know, going through the, you know, the depression part of the grief cycle as well. A lot of things that used to bring me joy and connection Absolutely. I just, just weren't doing it for me. I didn't have the energy, you know, I'd go into nature and it was like, so what, you know, it was really, it was just like the world had, the color had drained out of the world. It was yeah. such a tough period. And then, and sometimes too, the idea of doing it is then it's like, well, I'm giving, yeah, I, and, or I'm giving this up, you know, it, it's that acceptance is, you know, how do I let go of, if the truth is that's what I wanted, yeah. the truth is yes. also that's not what I have. Yeah. So if I'm acknowledging something else or creating that connection or growing something somewhere else, who am I? What is the guilt? What are the feelings around that? The grief mm -hmm. of letting go of what I thought I was going to grow. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that last bit, actually, when I started to come out of my grief, or rather come through it, you know, so, mm -hmm. and I started feeling better. Then I started feeling guilty about feeling better. Yes. Because, which I kind of think of as our kind of version of survivor's guilt, because I thought, well, if I can start mm -hmm. to feel better, that means I didn't really want children. And I would be yes. like, yes, I did. I spent 15 years of my life wanting to have children. And, you know, five years recovering from that. Um, mm -hmm. But it was really interesting. I think letting go of the grief in the end was letting go of the last bit of those children. It was, but it wasn't a kind of a one day thing. I found that my acceptance came in, in, in little bits and then they all added up. And then it was like, one day I realized I was in a different place. Um, and for me, it usually comes, I usually realize in retrospect that something shifted. I'll be like in a, a situation I've been in before. Yeah. And I'll find I behave very differently or I find it as to be a different experience than I expected. And I'll go, oh, that's new. Yeah. That would have, that would have floored me a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then I do think there are those spots, you know, mm. um, where your breath can still be taken oh, away. Totally. Because it's, it's, it's embodied. It's, it's a knowing. It's a knowing that we always have, uh, not as a tragedy, but as a recognition. Mm. Well, my grief and, is a precious part of me, you know, that it, it you know, childlessness broke my heart. Yeah. Grief healed it bigger. I think mm. I'm a bigger, more compassionate, more loving person. But that grief is in there. And yes. It's not going to go away, and I don't want it to. It's no. part of yeah. who I am. You yeah, know, I what, think what I've been allows, through. Yeah, I think it allows that lens and that recognition. You know, this this lens of not having children. If people, what people have experienced or been traumatized, I do think it's a trauma. I think to have want to have a child and and not. I think that is a whole nother conversation that um, needs to be touched on. Um, but whatever someone's trauma is, when you have that lens, when you can go past the grief and the learning and the healing, as you've said, it, it becomes this pool that is, is the gateway. It's literally a gateway to, uh, in, <laughs> to, to other people, yeah. Yeah. you know, totally. situations. And that's why I think these conversations and where we are in this acceptance needs to be more visible, not as an obligation, but as a choice as, when there's a space of readiness, 
to mm -hmm. offer that because that's what shifts things. And that's a part of it. It's a part of constructing a lens for people who don't have it. Yeah. And it's a part yeah. of connecting with the lenses of other people who do have that yeah. and just have not had this particular one. Well, can well, you imagine sort of rewind two years, three years, four years, five years, and mm -hmm. imagine you're a woman who is grieving your childlessness and you see this conversation. Can you imagine, I mean, I've got goosebumps imagining what it would have been like for me to just know that there were women out there in the world who've been through this, who've come through this, who are yeah. open about it and are kind of moving forward in, in a hopeful way about their lives. I mean, it just would have completely changed. I, I would have thought, well, that's never going to be me. You know, <laughs> I'm never yeah. going to get over it. <laughs> yes. But I yeah. would have, it would have planted a hopeful seed somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And that voice is necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not mm -hmm. just a therapist or a coach or somebody else saying that. Someone who has lived that, yeah. even when it doesn't look exactly the same. My God, the ways that we have come here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, oh, yes, the, be the, the beauty, the relief in that. I mean, the relief of finding something online that says there's a community here without even interacting. Yeah. So, yeah. so to be present to a conversation like this it, is a real gift. Mm -hmm. A real gift. It would have been. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> it is so to all of you out there, welcome. You're not alone. Yeah. Christine and I, we're, we're ahead of you. We're a couple of years ahead of you. But I, people who think I'm like some kind of guru, I'm like, uh-uh. No. I'm, I'm stumbling ahead in the dark. I'm just slightly ahead. But I'm pointing the torch behind me. You know. Um, but some, to pick up on something you said, this mm. has opened my heart to many other people and situations. I mm -hmm. think it has, it's, it's cracked open that, that vulnerable part of me that connects so deeply mm -hmm. with people. Um, and obviously in my, you know, my nearly, yes, nearly finished training to be a psychotherapist, one would hope I had that quality. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I'm busted on my final exam. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I really credit the grief with like burning away what isn't necessary for the next part of my life's journey. You know, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the social structures and assumptions, um, fantasies, some friends, work situation. Yeah. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I feel like I've, I'm traveling light yeah, now. Nice. Beautiful. Yeah, which is a, a great feeling. I mean, it's terrifying at the time when you're standing in the middle of the fire. <laughs> it doesn't feel that good. And when you're holding everything, yeah. you know, as you said, and, and for how long, or in how many circles, I always picture it as this recycling, you know, my um, for how long it's, ex it's exhausting, you know, and it's not something you just step out of. Well, if you don't have the, the support to do your grief work, mm -hmm. and this is something I've really learned through my journey, is I found out I was grieving because of doing my psychotherapy training. I thought, hang on a minute this course we're doing, this really makes sense. And I went home and I kind of mapped the models against my experience of childlessness. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm grieving. Which first of all, I thought, that means I'm not going mad, which was a good sign. Right. But also yeah. that means that one day this will be over. Mm. Oh, and that was such a relief. I didn't know how or how long, but I knew somehow grieving was a process that eventually came to an end. But what I learnt, and I write about it in my book, is that grief is a dialogue because it's a form of love. And a lot of what people experience as grief is what I think of as unrequited grief. Mm. It's grief that doesn't have an other yeah. um, to, to kind of process, whether that is an online community, a bereavement therapist, a, a fellow nomo who can look you in the eyes and, you know, get it, or reading your yeah. book, reading my book, you know. There's lots of different ways to have that experience, but I think a lot of us think that we have to grieve on our own, in our heads, in our rooms, using yeah. our thoughts, and mm -hmm. not sharing it. And it, it doesn't work like that. And I meet women in their 60s who are, you know, they're ready to do the work now because the support is there now. Right, right. Right, the conversation. And even the way I wrote in my book about self, other, and world, mm. it's from mm. that 
the lens of that. We have our own individual experiences, but then creating that connection, not not as the, yay, now I'm over here celebrating, but as the move toward letting go of that. And also just being witnessed in a compassionate way. Witnessed I mean, in a compassionate way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then moving it into the world. I mean, there are things happening around us that, you know, you have pioneered things around that again with, you know, aging without children. What is happening in our systems? What are those systemic conversations that then affect us or re-trigger re things? Who are we going to be to that? Are we going to be the decision makers? Or are we going to be affected by that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think once we start connecting you know, relationally and then into that, I think it breathes, my life breathes very differently when I, when I feel that sense of legacy, tribe, yeah. all of those, yeah. those spaces that we can affect totally for ourselves. And I think and as we come through our grief and feel our identity as something we can move in again, you know, we, yes. and that's quite a piece of work and takes as long as it takes. As you say, the next step is to is to kind of take take it out into the world, and we each have a different way of doing that. Um, and you know, I, I I love that side of it. And I was thinking one day, if you think about it in the in the history of, well, in the history of human civilization, mm -hmm. there um, there have never been before so many women healthy, educated, financially independent, astute, compassionate, alive in their 40s and 50s, not involved in bringing up children. I think we are the most extraordinary resource for healing in this world. Absolutely. And if we can come together as a tribe and feel proud of our identity and not ashamed, I think, look out world. I think there's, you know, this is at a time when so many of our kind of patriarchal, political and social structures are breaking at the seams. Exactly. And many of our wonderful men are also completely out of ideas and exhausted and confused. You know, I just think to bring all that, all those mother's hearts into the public space in an organized and compassionate way, yeah. Yeah. I think it could really change a lot of things. Absolutely. And I think on the individual level, you know, part of what I wrote to and what I would like to do is to celebrate us as individuals, I mean, we are women doing so many things, you know, it doesn't have to be a mega legacy. It doesn't have to be, you know, that you are childless. I think that's so it's important. Who are we being? Yeah. And who can we be, yeah. you know, individually yeah. and collectively? And there's a really powerful space there yeah. that is still yeah. untapped. It's waiting for us to claim it. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the Gandhi quote, you know, first they ignore you then they mm. laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think we're somewhere yes. in the ignoring laughing space. Yeah, yes. Which means there's a fight coming, you know, yeah. and I look to the extraordinary work that the gay liberation movement has done in the last yes. generation. And, and I take great inspiration from that going forward for us. As um, do I, absolutely. Mm. absolutely. And then, you know, the experience of being, you know, being a lesbian uh, childless woman is, you know, there are so many sub-identities within this. That can be oh really problematic too, um, yes. within, within the lesbian community, but also within the hetero community. Because, you know, there can be an assumption that because you're a lesbian, you, you didn't want children because you're not, yeah. you're not a real woman somehow. So, oh, you yeah. know, the fact that, you know, the idea that they, no one even thinks twice sometimes that they might be grieving... Mm -hmm. you know, there's just so, as you say, it's just so much work to be done. I'm just it's, adding. It's multi I mean, it's so multi-layered, and I think that's the distinction, you know, to the the common conversation or definitions, accusations, stereotypes. Is that it's it's not what it looks like, and and we know yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's helped me to be more thoughtful and curious about mm -hmm. other situations where yeah. I might be carrying ignorant prejudice about things it's do you know what I mean it's made me think oh, maybe I don't know what's going on here maybe you know right. around issues of, of race and difference you know mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking now there's a lot I don't know and there's a lot that I'm assuming because I used to be I used to be a woman who thought she was going to have children I never thought about childlessness 
a lot mm. of the prejudices I experience, I think I probably had towards childless women because mm. I'm part of the culture. I'm not some you right. know, species from outer space. Right. I have the same conditioning and I've had mm. my eyes opened by living through this. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when I think back, I think I just... I did not see this coming until it was here. <laughs> you know, it was, Actually, it was, I didn't see it coming for a while, even when it was here. <laughs> you know, and then um, it was actually why I focused so much on the social piece was because it was what was coming at me. I, I really wasn't ready for it. I didn't expect it. Um, and I thought, wow, what is this? Yeah. So you talk about that, that fight coming or that resistance. Part of it's already here. You know, in the U.S. with declining marriage and birth rates, there's a push for that. I mean, it's a paradigm that has worked for a long time for certain people and certain systems. And so this is bigger than the individual level. I mean, it's a, it's a very systemic change that needs to happen, that will happen. The reluctant pioneers, I call us. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to press on and I've got another question which is I've experienced nature as a very healing companion on my childlessness recovery journey but I've never done any work in nature such as your equine nature retreats. How do you see them helping with the healing process for childless women? Yes, I think for me, um, nature has been such a big part of my journey, my learning journey, my grieving journey, my, my healing journey. And the presence with horses, I've been doing this work for about, I don't know, eight years or so, um, brings us right back into the present, as does nature. I think it allows us a space to hear ourselves. It he allows us to kind of meet that unmet connection of compassion in a space that is non-judgmental, sometimes that doesn't need words. So instead of going through the steps and the conversations and the, you know, more noise, mm -hmm. it really allows us to drop in and to listen and to have a messenger or a teacher or a partner that is giving you nothing but the truth of your beauty as you're standing there right now, your pain, off offers, offers compassion through just existing and being with you. And also feedback around maybe some of the harshness, you know, and judgments that you're bringing to yourself and invite you into a different place. And the shift that happens, as you know, um, in nature or, or with a large, beautiful animal like this, is so efficient and immediate. It's a distinction to, you know, the coaching process that I would do one-on-one -on -one speaking with people. And it doesn't mean that you're in, you're in grief and then a minute later you're standing out of it, but something profoundly shifts. There's a space in there that is unnamed that happens that just through a human conversation doesn't happen the same way or in the same time frame. And it allows for something very, very deep and transformative mm -hmm. in the most organic, real way. Um, wow. Deeply experiential. Wow. You're really selling it to me. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I've been, I mean, I really look forward to the day when, you know, we meet either in Europe or America and, yeah. you know, we go riding together. And I'm actually deeply moved by your description because as you were describing it, I think I was going into that space a little bit. That, that, mm -hmm. that deep, unconscious, peaceful healing space. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I can imagine how, how powerful that would be. And if you do it with another group of child, you know, with a group of childless yes. women, so you can be yeah. honest about how profoundly you're touched. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, that witnessing and sharing those things mm -hmm. that, you know, all our, our stories are so different. And I know we, I keep saying that over and over again, but they are. And it's so the important that they're so different. And they're so similar and they're so different. Uh, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think moving through that and feeling like, oh, wow. <laughs> again, I'm not alone. But I think in that face to face, you know, some of the work that you do as well, I think it's really important for us to move into that now, you know? Mm -hmm to be with each other through yeah. this. Yeah. So when yeah. did the horses come into your life? I mean, did you ride as a child or how did, I, how did it happen? I did, I grew up with horses okay. and then I was away from them for a long time, traveling and school for many years and I had a coaching practice mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I really, it just came up kind of organically and I was like, 
huh, I wonder if you could do this with horses and be outside. I no longer wanted to be in offices, hotel, conference. I don't, I don't do much work inside at all <laughs> for any reason. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I started looking and there were people who were doing it. And there are women who have been doing this for decades um, and who have been really privileged to, to study with some for nearly 60 years. They've been doing this work, but it wasn't known, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't known in the wider circles. And so um, in 2009, I came out to California for a week to do a training and, um, and then I ended up staying for the whole training and got certified and kind of stayed here and kept working in that. And, and, you're, into still, the- and you're still there. Yeah, and I'm still here. <laughs> so actually, the horses brought me to California yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, that's, a beautiful, um, that's the title of your autobiography, yeah? The horses <laughs> the horse. brought me to California. That's yes. lovely. <laughs> the horses brought me here, yeah. yes. So um, we're coming nearly to the end of the interview. So I've got one more question for you. So what are your hopes and plans for the Mother Within website and your mm-hmm. book? Yes, with the, the book, I really want to keep it accessible mm-hmm. to people. Um, it's affordable. Hopefully people can download it with the software. I really just want to keep it accessible and as a conversation piece. Um, really to utilize the book not only as a conversation piece um, among ourselves, but as a, as a bridge conversation. You know, I speak to other things that we as women yeah. can address yeah, yeah. Um, in this. Um, and with the website, what I really, really wanted to create, because I did not need to build another website, <laughs> <laughs> was I really wanted to create, you know, this white space, a canvas of our expression that is different than the, some of the conversations that we have right now, not only speaking to, you know, what are, what are those key things that have shifted our journey or could shift our journey in changing the conversation? So having those conversations, but who are we? You know, what does your art look like? Who are you? That's what I want to celebrate. Um, I want to know who we are as women. That's beautiful. So it's like putting a face and a story and a narrative and an artwork on, you know, on the framework of this, you know, this this huge population of invisible women. Yes. Yes. So really the visibility piece. Well, that's that's beautiful. Well, it's been absolutely wonderful. Really, really wonderful. I mean, I've, I've loved getting to know you over the last couple of years, and it's a real privilege uh, to, to talk to you. And thank you so much for giving me such a heartfelt thank you in your book. I was really touched when I read that. So, You're welcome. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So thank you. So I'm Jodie Day, and I've been interviewing Christine Erickson, author of The Mother Within book and her website. You can find Christine's book on Amazon, on Kindle, or visit her website, themotherwithin.com. And all details on this will be on the Gateway Women website as well. So thank you so much for talking to me this evening, Christine. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.